Your mind is limitless. The possibilities are endless. Awaken Your Mind Magic shows you how you can dream limitlessly and live your life on a new level. Kathleen speaks with ordinary people who are living extraordinary lives using the power of their minds. Abundance, prosperity and success. There are no limits to what you can dream. Join Susan Kathleen on a journey into your dreams, making a difference and living life on your own terms. This is Awaken Your Mind Magic. Hello and welcome everyone. My guest speaker today is Donald Vasicek, who is from Colorado in the USA. Donald is an award-winning writer, filmmaker and owner of the Zen of Writing and provides his clients with writing and filmmaking consultation. He studied sociology and political science at the University of Colorado and learned film directing, film line producing and film producing certificates with the Hollywood Film Institute. Donald's focus is on everything from a short letter to a major motion picture and everything between. He has won numerous, highly acclaimed filmmaking and producing awards. To name some of them, winner of the Indie Gathering Documentary Short Film Competition in 2005, Sand Creek Massacre. The Audience Choice Award, Lyon Film Festival, The Road Home. And Best Film, Philip F. Miller Libraries, The Bull Theatre Film Project, The Sand Creek. Creek Massacre. I've been fortunate to have known Donald as a friend for more than 20 years when we met through Authors Den, a place where authors, writers and journalists get to showcase their creative work together. Welcome, Donald. It's so good to have you here today and thanks for taking time out from your busy writing, film producing schedule to speak with me today on Awaken Your Mind Magic. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm very honored to be here. I have a high regard and a high respect for you, your work, and how much you're helping other people. And so it's, it's really an honor to be here to visit with you today. You're an amazing man. And I have to tell a little, a little story to everyone. We got our times mixed up. Well, I think I did. And I was meant to interview Donald last week. And he called me at 1 a.m. in the morning, Brisbane time. (laughs) And I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, my hero. And I didn't get to speak to him. So he's taken time out to speak to me and all of you today. And I'm so grateful for it. Don, you have an empowering story to share with the listeners today. Start from where you feel comfortable to share your life with us here on Awaken Your Mind mind Magic, when you awakened and how you turned your life towards this incredible creativity and positivity. I uh, simply say this. I'll start simply by saying uh, my awakening, the first awakening, I've probably had several awakenings in my life, but the first one is when I, I lost my wife and kids. And that was like uh, I was annihilated. I, I was frozen. I, I was so gripped by the tragedy that I didn't know where to go, what to do, what to say, how to act, how to react. I was simply just frozen. And uh, this was when I was very young, in my 20s, and I knew nothing about life then and I was trying to find my way trying to discover who I was where I belonged what I should be doing in my life in my future and so I've evolved from there and from that point forward 
everything I did uh, always included my wife and kids. Uh, they 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 were and have always been the driving force behind everything I write, films I make, who I am. They have been and are my passion, and it re- it's reflected in my work, and not directly necessarily, but it's there. But all of that equals L O V E, love, and that's. I evolved from that tragedy to um, I became homeless, lived out of the backseat of a 1954 Oldsmobile, which was an American-made car. And I went to a gas station in the mornings to shave and clean up, to go out and try to find work for the day uh, and uh, do my business and stuff. And I always... At the time, wanted to be a lawyer, so I saw an ad in the paper. A law firm was looking for a law clerk. I applied for the job. I was hired for the job, and that was an awakening. That put me into an environment with um, professional people, well-trained people, educated people, and wonderful people. It, it was it was it was probably the the greatest experience in my life. And I spent six and a half years there as a uh, manager of client records. And also I helped launch what is known today as paralegals or legal assistance. We were uh, the Rocky Mountain Legal Assistance Association was one of the first of its kind in the country. And I began writing uh, articles for the newsletter, which went out to uh, a wide variety of people in the legal profession. And uh, I always wanted to go to law school, but during that period of time, uh, something I never knew, did not know, and did I did not learn this until uh, just uh, maybe two or three years ago, another awakening. I had ADD, and I didn't realize it. In order to get through college, I had to, I would write down passages from the textbooks and memorize those passages passages i couldn't read and retain i couldn't sit long enough i i really had a lot of problems with that but anyway i managed to get through college and uh got uh you know fairly decent grades but uh so anyway uh while i was at the law firm i got into college i was pushing to get into law school uh the senior partners in the law firm were totally behind me actually they wanted me to just practice law with them without going to law school. I was that good in legal work and I was doing a good job for them. And uh, the senior, senior partner, Mr. Saunders became a mentor of mine. Uh, he was a, he was a curmudgeon guy. He was mean, but he was also had a very sensitive heart. And uh, I, I was really plagued with a lot of, uh, financial problems during that time based on the tragedy. And he would occasionally call me into his office, lock the door, sit down, Don. So he'd sit down. He says, he'd pull out his checkbook and wave it there and say, how much money do you need today? How much money do you need? He said, I've been blessed. I'm a rich man and I want to share it with you. You, you need financial help. And I never accepted any. I guess that was another awakening. Nobody had ever treated me like that before. Anyway, uh, I took the law school exam and, and failed miserably at it, primarily because of the ADD. Uh, Mr. Saunders, uh, was in the law school I applied for, the University of Denver Law School. Uh, he was, he was on the board of directors there and he did everything he could to get them to accept me. They would not. And as it turns out, uh, they would not because of my background, which my dad was, uh, was in oil and gas, but he wasn't wealthy. So that was another waking. So one afternoon, Mr. Saunders says, uh, uh, he says, you're welcome to stay with the firm. Uh, we'll give you legal work all the time. We'll sponsor that work. Uh, but he says, 
And by then I'd been writing poetry, getting a lot of it published. And, and he, um, said, based on what I've read about what you write, he said, he said, you have to be a mean son of a bitch to be a lawyer. And he says, I don't see that in you. What I see in your writing <laughs> is a lot of goodness and love. And he says, that's the direction you should go. So I did. I went that direction. I, I got my uh, college degree and I struck out on my own and, uh, fumbled around a lot trying to make a living as a writer. Um, didn't really do very well. I had to, I created my own business, uh, independent paralegal business. Got a lot of clients via law firms. Did that while I was doing my writing. And then finally, another awakening was, uh, uh, Success Unlimited, which at the time was a, a magazine out of Chicago. And it, it, uh, it published a poem of mine titled Dad. And that, that really sent me off into the writing world. And, uh, so let, let me think, uh, I, I don't, it's, the story's getting too long. So I want to, <laughs> try to jump ahead if I can. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I wrote and I started making money by doing business plans and doing a variety of different kind of article writings for different organizations and, and, uh, magazines and newspapers and, uh, what have you. And, uh, always sort of just trying to make ends meet. And, uh, uh, then, uh, I did meet a woman. Uh, we fell in love with each other. We got married and another awakening into my life. I'd never been anyone like that. Uh, the way she, uh, thought and thinks, the way she acts and reacts, what she was doing in her life was amazing to me. Just amazing. She was a happy woman and that's something that I had very little, uh, understanding about. How to be happy. It's like I've always said, if you can look in the mirror and smile, that means you're happy. That's not an easy thing to do. If you, for a lot of people, I know it was, it was for me. And anyway, so, uh, from that point forward, uh, let me think, uh, here. I did, I did acquire a, a good writing job as a sports, uh, editor and writer for a, a newspaper. And, uh, that, that, I really like, love that because, uh, I love sports and I'm, I'm just sort of, I know sports. So it's easy to write sports and uh, get inside the minds of the athletes and the coaches and uh, the fans and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, so then I, uh, started writing a novel titled was December Kill. It was a mafioso story. And as I was struggling with that, and working as a sports writer, uh, I read a column in the Denver Post about the Sand Creek Massacre. And I'd read about it periodically throughout the years I'd lived in the Denver area, and I never really paid much attention to it. But after reading the column, uh, I, I wrote the columnist a note back and told her how f- effective the column was, uh, how it affected me. And she says, you ought to make a documentary film about it. And I said, well, I've never made a film before. She says, well, learn how. So I discussed with my wife, and she basically said the same thing. So I did. And I made the film. And uh, another awakening, I learned about the Native American culture. Actually, I I shouldn't say Native American because most of the indigenous people in America – do not like to be called Native American. They're indigenous. They aren't American. You you know, they're maybe they're natives, but this is their land. We live on their land. And I've always said uh, to to folks who are skeptical about our indigenous people, how would you feel if somebody uh, built a tent in your front yard without your permission and then they start coming into your house to use your bathroom, use your kitchen, 
and then pretty soon you're living out in the backyard and they're living in your house. How would you feel about that? That's what's happened to America's indigenous people. So anyway, yes. That is so interesting, Don, because I'm in Australia at the moment and the Aboriginal people, the oldest tribe of people in the world, feel the same way. I've spent a lot of time with the Maori people in uh, New Zealand, and it's the same thing. So thank you so much for sharing that. And obviously, I also have spent many, many years in different African countries, and the Africans feel the same way, and they don't like to be called natives. So thank you for bringing that up and pointing it out to the audience. Sure. Uh, anyway, uh, just uh, with the indigenous people of America, I uh, I had some real frightening experiences. My life was threatened several times by white people and uh, some of the indigenous people. I, I was on many uh, reservations where I ended up being the only white person on that reservation while I was there doing what I was doing there. And uh, some of the indigenous people threatened me. It terrified me. And, but what, what I got from all of that was the fear in them. And even today, they grieve about the loss of their ancestors at Sand Creek. And to think about it, if you think about it for a minute, how would I feel if I knew that there were people who murdered my ancestors, who wanted to eliminate all of my ancestors. If that would have occurred, I wouldn't be here today. So, you know, that's a real fearful thought for the indigenous people. And racism is rampant in, in America. Uh, the president that we have, many of the uh, senators in the government, they're racist. Uh, it's, it's a horrifying experience we're going through in this country right now. And I am hopeful we can turn it around. But anyway, uh, anyway, the Sand Creek Massacre uh, won several film festivals. It, it was awarded the Gold Drover Award, which is prestigious Western award here. Brilliant. Um, and, good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I, w I was able to meet a lot of people in the film industry. And uh, I began writing screenplays. I set my no novel aside. It's not the easiest thing in the world to write a novel. Actually, it's maddening. <laughs> but you're compelled. And so I, I, I started getting writing screenplays. I wrote a couple that got me a lot of mileage in Hollywood. Got me an agent. I went to work for MGM. Did a lot of writing, consulting with them. Uh, and I realized, I realized, uh, and I wanted to make my own movies and direct my own films. And that's where I, that's what I was really after. But what I learned is unless you're in the loop in Hollywood, forget it. And it's very difficult to get in the loop. You can be the most talented person on earth. That does not mean you're going to get into the loop. It's a combination of other factors. And I, I did not put those factors together. And I start, I took a step back and looked and I thought, you know, actually, I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore because in order to do it, I'm going to have to, I have to, I'm going to have to become a jerk. And I'm not saying everybody in Hollywood's a jerk, <laughs> but there's too many, there's too many I love yous and the word love is abused. So anyway, that's a whole another story. So I evolved from that to uh, I did make some documentary films like Sand Creek, and I made one on who gays and lesbians really are. That was distributed to a lot, many places in the country. Uh, I made uh, Sand Creek. I made oh, I made a. Uh, a documentary for kids on all the places you can go. And that was fun. And um, I'm trying to get back on track here. So I don't want to take up 
all your time with all the stuff. There's because no way I, you take up my time, Don. <laughs> I, I, I just finished my autobiography, and it's titled My Remarkable Life. I'm an eclectic person, and I've uh, done a lot of things, and I didn't realize what kind of person I was until I start writing the autobiography. And I realized, uh, man, and, and, and the reason for that being eclectic is because of the ADD. You know, that, that's kind of interesting because what I learned to do many years ago when I start writing in my novel, I can only go so far. So I switch to something else. And I focus on that. Then I switch back to the novel or whatever it is. Maybe that's why I was able to make some documentaries and also write. But that, that's, that was another awakening when I learned that by writing my autobiography. Anyway, uh, awakenings, uh, meeting my wife, marrying her, uh, and, uh, she, she's just been marvelous. Uh, I can't say enough good about her. Uh, I would have, I would have probably ended up in an institution if I hadn't mar- met her. <laughs> Not really, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, Don, I've been in the educational system for 40 plus years. I mean, I know that you've been writing for 40 plus years. Um, I haven't been writing that long. I think I got my um, qualifications in journalism about, about 30 years ago. <laughs> oh, really? really? <laughs> but you know, I've worked and I actually studied to work with ADD children and young adults, uh, spurges and dyslexia. And they're some of the most gifted, incredible creatives. And when, I, and when you talk about how you sort of bounce from one subject to another, that's part of somebody with ADD or Asperger's, um, even dyslexics, because their minds are so fast. They, they work in a certain way. And most of them turn out to be incredible musicians or artists or writers. And so this is this is an epiphany where I'd like to let the listeners know that there's nothing wrong with you. Everything is right with you. And that is where you can look at yourself like writing your biography, Don, and see how incredible you actually are and how you've managed to do so many things. When you talk about your wife and how amazing she is, what does she do? What does she do for a living? She, uh, throughout her career, she was in special education and she was, she was the one you can relate, right? That resonates with you. Um, she, and she wouldn't subscribe to this. It's based on my observation on the outside looking in, observing her. She, she, taught teachers how to teach kids with special needs, okay? And she evolved from that into autism, and she, uh, how can I say, these days, or in the last several years, she travels around the state of Colorado. She works for the Department of Education, Colorado, and she travels around to different schools teaching faculty uh, how to teach kids with special needs. And there are many small, isolated schools and towns in Colorado. Uh, it's still the old west out here. And it's those small schools. It's amazing how many areas of Colorado have special needs kids. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, it's tragic. Uh, we, she and I coached Special Olympics middle school basketball for 20 years. And I learned how to interact with these kids. Down syndrome, autistic, uh, emotional problems. And it's really interesting that when you get right down to it, they are just as human as we are. And if you give them love and sensitivity, even if they want to smack you in the face, which some of them tried to do with me, uh, you know, you turn the other cheek and you give them love and it, it's a wonderful experience. But so that's what she's doing. She's continues to, uh, teach, uh, faculty and parents 
on how to incorporate special needs kids in the school programs for learning. This is wonderful news as well, because Donna, I've watched you on your social media outlets as well, and also listened to a lot of things that you're doing. You work very closely with a lot of young adults and children. Can you let the audience know more about what you do for them? Yeah, yes, I guess, right. Well, since you mentioned that, uh, I, I'm jumping all over the place here. I, it's it's going to so drive good. your editor crazy. <laughs> no, um, you won't. <laughs> another awakening is uh, I was flying on an airplane to Phoenix to spend a few days with my brother and his wife. And I, I was writing a screenplay while I was on the airplane. And uh, I was writing it, and it caused me to laugh out loud. And at the time, it was a screenplay, and it was titled The Real Ghost. And it was a kid's story. And as it turned out, it never, it never was made into a movie, but I, uh, changed it into a novel. I wrote a novel and the novel was won the, uh, Waldorf Publishing Book Award. It, it was published. It was released on October 15th and now it's out there in the world where kids can get their hands on it. And that was an awakening, awakening to me because what I did in that book that I've never done before in my writing of any kind was I, I was able to be who I am. And, and I'm kind of silly. The, the book is kind of silly, quirky, a lot of suspense. It's kind of, it causes, I, I envision this. Kids, when they read it, they're going to crawl under the covers with chills, but yet they're going to laugh out loud. <laughs> you know, that's quite a dichotomy if you think about it. It is. So, so anyway, that was another awakening. I learned how to really write and be myself and, and make it effective, be successful with it. And so uh, I think uh, getting – I'm sorry. Do you think that writing for children is what made you be yourself? Because you're actually working with these young, absorbent sponges, and you can just be you. Yeah. Very well expressed. Yes. Brilliant. It's, uh, kids, I think I've learned more from kids than I have from uh, adults. Yeah, especially, I mean, you, you, if you start like holding a baby that's one month old and five months old or whatever, you watch them and they're taking in information that's amazing. It's awesome. You know, to, to just watch their eyes and they're, they're, they absorb so much, so rapidly. I marvel at that. I love that. <laughs> you, you, you have every right to, because I adore it as well, because they're just curious little beings. And, and, you know, in my, in my, um, teaching and when I'm coaching, I like people to think, and know that those little souls were creative even before they were even conceived into being a human. They were sitting there waiting in the Akashic Records, waiting to be able to be born and birthed. And that is why they come onto this earth and they're just so curious because, hey, they've been a spirit for so long in the, in the a cosmic energy and now suddenly they're allowed to be a human and they're looking around and having a look and decide what to do. What do you think, Don? I, I think that's marvelous. That's very well expressed. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you know, to, to, <laughs> to jump back and, and try to get this uh, back in focus a little bit. Uh, during the tragedy of loss of my family, I don't want to go into that too much. Yeah. But subsequently, family, friends, and others made me the scapegoat for their loss. And I, I was ridiculed. I was verbally abused. I was destroyed. I was driven into bankruptcy. I was driven into the streets. And the main reason for that is because I didn't know who I was. I had no self-confidence, even though prior to being married at a young age, I excelled in high school, 
music, athletics, theater, uh, scholastics, whatever. But based on the loss of my family and the ridicule that I received from that, it lit a fire in me that I'd never had burning inside of me before. It, 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 was, it turned into an inferno that drove me to succeed at whatever I did. And that propelled me into my future, into, into, into writing, into being successful with writing, and into filmmaking, being successful with that as I have been, and interacting with people. That, that was the main thing, is to learn how to interact with human beings, something I'd never been taught, didn't know how. I grew up in a dysfunctional family. Um, uh, I didn't know how. I didn't know. There's a lot of things I didn't know. Don, when you speak about this, one thing I've observed, and I'd like the audience to um, to understand as well, is very often a tragedy is the demise of us in a certain way, like you ended up sleeping in your car and using the gas stations, uh, bathrooms and things like that. It's a transition of us. And as you say, it put that burning fire and desire in to you to succeed. And people can be so cruel. Instead of stepping back and seeing the incredible big picture of your tragedy and empathizing with you and uplifting you as best they can you get this really cruel streak in in humanity that um i'm praying that with covid19 we are going to reflect and rethink on how we behave towards each other because it can actually cause massive depression and psychological um post traumatic stress and all sorts of things when you talk about this fire the, there is a, it's an intrinsic desire to prove to yourself that you are a good human and that you have this mass of creativity. Like you say, you were incredible at school and then this tragedy and it can change your life and you can take a, take a choice of whether you do what you've done or just sit back and say, well, that's it. I'm going to live in my pity party for the rest of my life. You, Don, have done incredible things. And one of them is 500 published books. 500 published books. <laughs> Talk to us about that. Well, you know, a lot of those books are based on uh, ghostwriting. Okay, clients. Many of those are like that, but you make some very good points and uh, a very good point about this fire. A, a time come in my life after the tragedy, I'm sitting in the back seat of this old car and it's cold outside and I'm, I'm cold. I'm hungry. I lost 50 pounds because I couldn't buy any food. And I thought about shoplifting some that I even tried that once. And you know what I did? I got outside the store. I went back in the store and put the food back. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this fire. So I'm sitting in this, in this car one dark, cold night. And I'm thinking, okay, what are you going to do? What do a lot of people do in a situation like this? Well, a lot of them start drinking. Others start doing drugs. They start abusing themselves. And I'm thinking, uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do any of those things. Then I thought, what can I do? Because I was being challenged with depression, severe depression, so severe. I didn't want to live anymore. That's how bad I went right, way down to the depths of bowels of hell with depression. And I fought that off. I got through it. And I, a lot of it was based, I think, on, in my genes. If you understand what I mean by yeah. that. Yeah. There was a power inside of there, inside of me, that kept me from going the wrong direction. It kept pointing me in the right direction. And I'm so grateful for that. So grateful. Even though today, as I sit here, I have an abysmal sadness. For uh, 
I miss my daughter and my son and, and my wife. I still love her very much. It's like I told my present wife and she understands it. I still have post-traumatic stress disorder from it. I do after all these years and I have to deal with that. Fortunately, I'm built in a way, uh, and again, I credit my genes to being able to deal with it and function somewhat normally. <laughs> well, you certainly do because, we, I mean, you're so successful. Talk to us about um, you've acted in the 20th century uh, Fox's Die Hard with a Vengeance and, um, oh, quite a few. Um, ABC's Father Dowling. I used to watch that all the time. Really? And, um, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and Angel Street Films Running Horses. I mean, you've acted, let alone creating um, screen screenwriting and a Sanskrit um, everything like that. You've you've done this too. Tell us about that. that well, life as an actor. The uh, the uh, the biggest film was Warriors of Virtue. It was a fifty six million dollar action film uh, produced by MGM, and I became a writer consultant on that project. And it was about Kung Fu kangaroos saving this village from Komodo, the evil dragon. And that that was a kid's story, too. And I really excelled at that. And uh, I I interacted with, oh, man, talk about Hollywood and writing. I I ended up in a room with nine other writers and we and the producers. And we sat there and we banged out the first. 10 minutes of the film uh, in script form. And then that separated the writers and uh, the producers made a decision on staying with two of the writers. One wasn't me and they paid us very nicely for it. But six months later, they called me up and said that the two writers they hired, it just didn't work out for them. And they wanted me to rewrite the script. So I did. And it took off from there. And then, uh, you know, like, uh, and Die Hard, that was fun because uh, yeah. I, I got I had a variety of jobs in that film. One was I no speaking parts, no real real acting, but there was acting. We did what the director told us to do. Uh, but one was standing outside of the airport, right outside of the main terminal, on ice at one o'clock in the morning, in dress shoes and overcoats, which I would advise every male on earth don't wear an overcoat to keep warm because they don't keep you warm. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, uh, (laughs) um, they look nice. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) anyway, uh, we had to stand there and wait for Bruce Willis to arrive at the airport. He'd come up in a, in a, forget what kind of car, but He'd jump out and run into the airport and he ran right between us. And, you know, we had to, you know, be amazed at that because he was, he was a police guy then and, uh, he was after the bad guy. And, and then I was sitting in the airport inside warming up. We were had a break and guess who came over and sat down beside me? I, I've, I've always been a loner. I don't go with crowds. So that period of time during that break, I was setting off by myself. It was Bruce Willis. Oh, Came fantastic. over and sat down. Yeah. yeah he, he, he sat down beside me and says, how's it going? <laughs> I said, great. How are you doing? <laughs> great. And so then we started talking. He says, what do you do? You know, he wanted to know what I did. He was very nice, very personable. And then uh, the producers came and got us and said, uh, told me that they wanted me to drive the car that Bruce would be riding. So they, I, I shook hands with Bruce and we parted and I went, uh, and I got in the car that was parked outside behind the steering wheel. And I sat there and waited. I was told as soon as he gets in the car, drive away. I waited. I waited. I waited. I think maybe two hours. Oh, wow. And finally somebody said, uh, let's, let's cut it off. We're, we're done shooting for tonight. 
So that was that experience, Die Hard. Father Dowling, uh, most of the scenes I did were shot at, uh, at the time it was, it was Stapleton Airport in Denver. We don't have that airport anymore. And, uh, Tom, uh, can't think of his last name, the, the star of the show, Tom, uh, doggone it, can't remember his last name. Uh, anyway, he, he was a, a smoker, man. Yeah. He smoked cigarettes and I thought, Oh, don't do that. And, uh, I was again in, in, in a, just a small clutch of people at the airport as he come walking through. That was my role. And that was it. And I never really got to talk with him or there were two or three other actors that, uh, the Nelson girl, uh, what was her name? She belonged to the Nelson family. Um, one or two other people. Oh, this older lady, I forget her name. She, she was a real seasoned actress to, in a lot of films. That's all there was to the father Dowling. Oh, we did some, yeah, we did some other shots outside the Denver Art Museum where I had to go walking by and, you know, just being a pedestrian <laughs> and uh, running while running horses, Pamela Cummings film. I was the sheriff. Okay. Ooh, the a, sheriff. Uh, wow. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I had a Stinson on. You did. Uh, yeah. And cowboy outfit. I put the, we were standing in this hotel and we, it was in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And the producer director was right there. She was, uh, we were talking over what had to be done. Now I had to change clothes and she said, go in the bathroom and change your clothes. I said, do you mind if I change them right here? There was nobody around. I said, I don't like going in bathrooms. I, I'm, I should think, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> you know, change clothes. Uh, I, I just didn't feel good about doing yeah. this. So while uh, she turned her back, I, I put on my cowboy outfit right there. And your Stinson, and, of course. And my Stinson, absolutely. <laughs> and so we went out, uh, and the first scene was in a bookstore where I was, we were chasing the, the bookstore. Somebody shoplifted some stuff. So they, they called me, the sheriff. I went there to, in, in there to investigate. And I had a lot of dialogue in there with, with the clerk and the customer. And, and then they saw the guy running past him and they said, there he is. So I'd run out of the store and chase him. <laughs> and at the time, my left knee was going out. Nice. ACL was burning up. Uh, I, so after, after that, I had my knee replaced, but I had to run on that gimpy knee for three or four or five blocks. And I'm athletic, but I, it was hard for me to do that while the camera was chasing us, you know, and that chased him into a back alley, into some kind of building. And I, uh, I, uh, arrested him there. Well, good for dialogue. you with your wonky knee as well. You, you bet. Good job you there, bet. Sheriff. Don't get your wood. I knew that uh, we we we've spoken about uh, Olympus Films in the intro. Um, you're the founder and owner of Olympus Films, and this is a global filmmaking and consulting company, and. You've done some incredible things with this company. Tell us more. Well, I formed the country, uh, the company based on, uh, I was hired by a, a nuclear physicist woman, uh, to make a documentary film about who gays and lesbians really are. Okay. And, uh, again, I told, her name was Lydia. I told her, Lydia, I, I've never made a film. She says, well, you can learn how. She says, I want you to make it for us. And she was financing it. So uh, I needed a film company. So I lived on a street called Olympus Olympus Place. And so I changed, I named it Olympus Films Plus LLC and made the film. And, uh, there's a story behind that, a big story. It, it turned out to be very well done. And anyway, there was a story that went with it that was crushing. Um, stories like that happen when you're making films. 
especially if you aren't experienced. Uh, I don't necessarily need to share the story. Yeah. Because it's, it's too debilitating mm. for too many people. Anyway, so, uh, that's with Olympus films. Then I, I evolved into, uh, making, uh, all the, the little documentary film for kids, all the places you go. It's, it's based off the Sesame Street, uh, title. Yeah. Uh, and it was based about what kids can do in, when they go to school. If, you know, go to school. That's kind of what it was about. And then the, the other film, uh, Olympus films. Oh, during that period of time, uh, I, I was getting a, it's amazing how I get writing, writing clients. And this is from all over the world. It's amazing. It's, that's, uh, in a sense, in a business sense, that's a plus of the internet. It's, it's been a plus for me that way. Yeah. Uh, people come to me and they, uh, a French actress hired me to write her biography. I went out to Laguna Beach, California, stayed with her for a week in her three and a half million dollar home with her boyfriend who was a, a doctor, got to ride on their yacht, sit on their patio and have a, have a drink and look at Catalina Island from, from their patio. Uh, went to the Laguna Beach Art Festival on a Thursday night, which consisted of walking uh, on the main street and going to different art galleries. And each art gallery had free wine. So by the 10th art gallery. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> and, and so uh, then then uh, her name is Liddy. Liddy said, Michael wants to take you for a ride in a sports car. And I forget what kind it was, but it was the best of the best. It was at night. She said, I'll drive home in, in our car. And so, uh, my, I got in Michael's car. Ooh, we went out on the Pacific Coast Highway and there's a, that can be real scary spots out there. And he took off. He was driving a hundred miles an hour and I was sitting there gripping the seat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you should have been went, okay after 10 glasses of wine. <laughs> yeah, well, that sobered me up. <laughs> I bet you it. <laughs> Maybe that's why he did it. <laughs> Maybe. Get some Maybe. fresh air there. <laughs> yeah. But I love I that. I, we, we had a lot of fun, and I helped her write her book there. Oh, she was, she was engaged to uh, Chris Stevens, who was the – United States ambassador to Benghazi. And he was one of the guys murdered at Benghazi. Oh, tragic. And writing, helping her write her story. Actually, it was a memoir about her, her involvement with Chris Stevens. It was about a year after it happened. And so that was one. Anyway, uh, to get back on track, uh, so during that period of time, I got a lot of writing clients and I start, I got so busy that I couldn't make films. I had to make a choice. And, and I just stayed with writing because I was enjoying it, making a lot of good money and paying the bills and all that. And so I came up with the Zen of writing. Yeah. So it's like Olympus Films, comma LLC, uh, slash the Zen of writing, slash Donald L. Vosicek. And, that that pretty well summarizes who I am. I'm eclectic. I have ADD, although I've got that totally in control with no medication, nothing like that. Yeah. It's all based on meditation and how I learned how to take care of my mind and uh, my brain. And uh, uh, so uh, I never really got back. I've always wanted to make film. I, if I had a choice, I would choose to make film. Produce, direct, I love it, and I know how to do it. But uh, it, it's really a challenge to to get money. The the administrative part of making films is it's not what I want to do. And I just talked to somebody. Oh, I've struck up a a conversation now with a woman in China. She's a finance maven. She's thirty one, and she's Wow, if she's successful, 
I love her mind. Yeah. You know, she's so bright and she, uh, why, why did I come up with her as something to do with making film? Uh, yeah. And also her incredible mind. This is about why you've chosen to go writing rather than making films. Is that possibly where we've led to here? Yes, that's a good point. Right. It's, it's, uh, it's frustrating because, uh, it's like, uh, Dharma. Uh, my Dharma doesn't rest just in, in one, one, one area or one activity. Yeah. It's, it's probably two or three. And, and I think that's what uh, the title of my autobiography, my remarkable life. That's part of what has made my life remarkable. That's what I mean by it. I've been blessed. I've been blessed because there are a variety of things I can do and do very well. And the bottom line of all of that is my interaction with human beings, the way I interact with human beings. Uh, and you know this because of your work and the good work you're doing uh, is uh, you not only help other people benefit and learn and grow and become better in, for themselves in their own lives, but you also learn and grow and become more better in your life. Make you, you, you learn and grow. And, and so that's, that's a, that's a perfect marriage. It totally that's is. Dharma. It You're is Dharma. Your Dharma. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Don, when you're writing and you, and the Zen of writing, I've found, especially when I'm working with clients, when they're going through a healing process, that writing is one of the most incredible ways to heal. Like you say, when you're writing your biography or you're writing somebody else's, you are reflecting at the same time. What would your message be to people about taking time out to journal and to write? I, I think... Uh um, writing uh, writing can be challenging. And if you're writing a journaling, for example, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is simply this. Regardless of what you write, it always has a tendency to want to go off on its own in your mind while you're writing. If you have characters involved or other people involved, you you're writing a story, a sort of a lineal story. You have to, you have to control that. So like with journaling, the question is, what am I writing here? Why am I writing it? It's the, it's the five journalistic questions you ask yourself. What, why, where, when, and how? I think how is the last one, but what, why am I doing this? That, that's the first step I always suggest to writers. Uh, it, it, when they ask me for help is why are you writing this? Why do you want to write this? And, it, and even with journaling, it goes back to one word. I say one word, passion. What is your passion for writing this? What is driving you to write it? Why are you journaling? Why are you doing this? What, what, what outcome do you want from it? And if you can answer those questions, then have at it. But if you can't answer those questions, then you need to take time to answer those questions before you begin writing. That's, I hope I answered your question. You, you have, and you've done it really well. And this is also where people, even in, in asking those questions, you're actually self-reflecting, which is, which is helping you with your Zen or your Dharma, as, as you were speaking about earlier on. Um, moving on from that, you've also written, directed, and produced some amazing um, productions, Faces, um, MGM's Warriors of Virtue, American Pictures, The Lost Heart, and Born to Kill. Can you talk to me about that? Don't know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
Justin, you have to cut out the alarm. <laughs> right. Can you speak to me more about those films, Don? Well, uh, The Lost Heart uh, was a film uh, by two South Korean men, Bobby and Richard Kim. Bobby Kim in Korea, if, if, you, if you know who this man was, he was noted at the time as the Charles Bronson of Korea in movies. Charles Bronson was a, an American actor who, back in the 1970s mainly. Oh, he was an amazing these, actor. Yeah. Oh, so you know of him. Oh, yeah. I used to watch his movies. <laughs> really? Yeah, so some of them are very suspenseful. Yeah. Very intense. Uh, anyway, uh, so Bobby uh, and Richard, Richard was their brothers. They were, Richard was the director. And they simply hired me to write their scripts for them because they didn't understand English that well. And they didn't understand how uh, Americans thought. Well, I was an American and I was a writer. So they hired me and I wrote The Lost Heart for them. Richard had drafted it and I, I took it and I rewrote it for, for them. And then they had me rewrite another script form titled Born to Kill. <laughs> it was an action. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was an, an action. <laughs> kill, kill, kill. <laughs> oh, my. I, I, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't like that too well. Oh, and, and, I could think with your soft heart you wouldn't have. <laughs> but the, the Lost Heart was a very sensitive, touching story about a man who searched for his lost heart, a woman, you know, and it was, it was, the location was Korea in the mountains. And, uh, he went into the mountains to find her. And the story evolved from there. I don't remember. I don't remember the, the entire story. Uh, so it's hard for me to say, much more about it other than uh, they they were raising funds to make the film and talk talk around the Denver area had it and I even asked them about it that they were connected to the mafia and that's how they were getting their money like I'd be sitting in their office <laughs> wow. on a Tuesday afternoon yeah. and we'd be going over the script or something and somebody, somebody would just walk in walk over to Bobby and pull a fat envelope out of his coat pocket, give it to Bobby and turn around and walk off. There was no greetings or anything. Bobby would put it in his desk and we'd go on with our meeting. That happened a lot. And so there was talk they were connected to the mafia and their films were mafia financed. And uh, whether that happened or not, I don't know. Well, but it was quite, it, it was kind of an experience. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a part of another script, I think. <laughs> I yeah. can see it happening. Bling. Yeah. <laughs> Don, right. you you were associate um, producer in, um, in the Angel Street films, um, and it's an award-winning short film, The Rose Garden. Talk to us about that. The Rose Garden. Let me think about it. Was it the road? It was. Wasn't it the road home? Yeah. So was ex- yeah, the road home. Yeah. I was executive Hammers. producer of that movie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, the Rose Garden. Uh, I did. I helped Pamela, the producer and director of that film. I helped her with a lot of, uh, you know, like holding the microphone, helping set up lighting, more technical stuff. I didn't even write on the script or act in the film right i just helped her out as a friend uh to, I, to do the production and i love the story about running horses being the sheriff and having a wonky knee <laughs> see <laughs> sheriff just got to keep on going even if his knees are sore <laughs> <laughs> what, i love that well, what a dichotomy <laughs> <laughs> it is <laughs> you know you know in, in in writing in film uh there's a mingling of dualities Sheriff Wonky Knee. It's also called uh, a dichotomy, or it's also called a 
Oh, there's a third thing it's called too, but the bottom line is, and you always see this in Hollywood movies, you know, there's always uh, a mixture of two main characters. One might be black and one might be white. One's a real nice person. The other one's a real bad person. You know, that kind of mingling of dualities. So, and that works in writing fiction. It's very powerful if you can master that to bring opposites together. You got a unity of opposites to, to unify opposites. That's powerful, powerful, uh, writing tool to have. With your Zen of writing, I mean, you'd understand the yin and yang to be able to do that, and you do it very well, I must say. So well, kudos to you, Don. Don, you. what would you say to the listeners and to the people you know when you're at the bottom in that big black hole with the dog of depression right there with you? What would you say to them to be able to get out of that and to move forward like you did? Well, as I described earlier about sitting in the backseat of that car and Mm. thinking about what direction I needed to take, uh, drinking alcohol, doing drugs, committing suicide, what? What should I do? I was so deeply depressed. Didn't want to go on living without my family. I didn't want to. I was a committed husband and father, and I that was it. That was it, and it was all gone, never to be retrieved. So what came to mind was simply this. I have no idea how it would be to die. Do you? Do you know how to die? Do you know anything about it? I mean, the dying process? What What's going on? I really believe that after... I die, I'm going to go on living. Absolutely. I really, I truly believe that. Do you? Yes, 100%. Yeah. yeah. So, but at the time I didn't know that. And I thought, well, if I'm going to die, how am I going to kill myself? And then I'm thinking, okay, I don't want anybody to find me dead because then I'll be a burden on them. Look at the problems I would create. That's where I thought. That's why I've always thought. I don't want to be a burden on anyone. So how can I do this? Oh, okay. Start this old car up. And I looked it up on a map even. Drive it up into Wyoming and drive it into the Green River and drown in the car. Nobody will ever find me or find the car. I thought about that. And then I thought, what a horrible way to die. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I was thinking I thought, that when you were talking to me about it. I was thinking, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the fine point of it is, is uh, I, lo- I was looking inside of myself. Okay. And I was thinking, I'm too terrified to die. I've got too much. There's too much goodness here in life and I have to find it. I don't know what it is right now, but I know there's goodness. I, I grew up uh, going to Sunday school every Sunday, going to church every Sunday. You know, I, I, I was a Boy Scout. Thank God before the time of sexual abuse, you know. Mm-hmm. I had a great Scout master. He was a, he was a mentor. You know, I, I grew up right. I had great, great experiences. It's uh, kindergarten, middle school, and high school. Great teachers, great town I grew up in. People were great. So all of that was working on me here as to, I hope I'm answering the question. Yeah, you are. um, Is what direction to take? And I thought, there's only one direction to take. I have to live, and I have to live well. I don't know how to do that right now, but I'm going to learn how. And you know, one of the most motivating people in my life at the time was, you know, I was always a reader. So I went to the library to find books, to find anything. There was no computers or Internet, nothing like that. And I spent a lot of time in the library anyway. So I I come across a book uh, uh, by Norman Vincent Peale. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. 
He goes way back. Yeah, he does. And Earl Nightingale is another one. Definitely. And uh, age, now I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> Napoleon Hill <laughs> yeah. was another one. One of my favorites. Really? So yeah. anyway, those are the books that really propelled me into the, my future. Reading those books, practicing what they were saying, how to do it, what to do, you know, everything. Uh, and, and I memorized those books. Think and Grow Rich. I forget uh, Norman Vince Peale's book, Earl Nightingale's. But I even got a tape of Earl Nightingale and listened to the tape. What a rich voice. Oh, brilliant. Yes. Amazing. It, it, it just, I love listening to him. Yeah, it's like liquid Liquid yeah. silk. <laughs> that's 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 a beautiful ex- expression of yeah. of his voice. Yes, you've listened to him. I can tell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, you did, Donald. That 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 lit the fire under me. Yeah, and then you had this burning desire, and this is what I'm I find so important to get out to people is when you have that positive thought that you are far greater than you actually know you are or think you are. And you put that into your mind. You have the ability and power to do anything because you, you, in your human form, you're a human. But like you say, and we both believe that there is life after death as a human, you are part of this massive, massive quantum energy field of incredible power. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's exact, that resonates with me perfectly. Yeah. Very well described. Yes. That's what absolutely. I teach my clients. <laughs> uh, well, you're, uh, I'm sure you're a very good teacher. <laughs> Thank that, you. uh, you know, uh, another part of this, and I know you know this is, is religion. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I grew up Methodist. When I met my first wife, she was Catholic, so we, we went to the Catholic Church, evolved from that into spirituality, meso- metaphysics. I started reading books on that. I learned how to meditate, and that's where I stayed. You know, that was most fulfilling to me. And that, to me, uh, in, in a way, it was, it was so uh, – it turned me inward to myself, yes. but yet turned me outward to others. Absolutely. The power of that. Yeah. Meditation is incredible and it is powerful. And that is when you're looking inward at your incredible intuition. And clearly you followed your intuition to be as powerful and as incredibly famous and humble at the same time. I have to let the listeners know, I mean, basically for more than 20 years, Donald and I have been in contact with each other and He has always got the time to speak to somebody else, no matter who you are, whether you're famous or you're just a gal from the southernmost tip of Africa at the time when I first met Donald. I was living in the last little village in the entire continent of Africa, Cape (laughs) Agullis. And I'm going to put this into the public now. You actually inspired me enough to become an international poet, recognized poet, through your poetry, and also a best-selling author. You did, Donald. Ah, really? Yes, you did. (laughs) So that's out in the public now. This is my mentor, and he didn't even know it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's, you know, that, uh, I think the fine point of that, Susan, to me is, I can see the joy in your face. And I can feel your heart. It's it's full of love and compassion. And I'm very happy that I was able to contribute to your growth, and to your happiness, to your joy, and to what you're doing and how how much you're helping other people. That's that's wonderful. Well, as I say, you've been an incredible mentor. <laughs> so thank okay. you for those compliments. They reflected everything that I have, you have. So it's our spirit. Um, we, we notice and recognize with it within and without each other. Donald. That's nice. It's brilliant. Donald, how can 
the people listening to this podcast get in touch with you? Uh, do you mean like via email or yeah, phone or, or your website? Obviously, I'm going to make sure that it's up there when we upload your um, podcast. However, it would be nice for you to be able to speak about it as well. Well, uh, I think uh, the website, it's just donbosicek.com. Contact information is on the website. Also, the face, Facebook page has, has got has contact information, has had background information on me. Actually, the website is got a, it has a ton of writing articles. I've written tons of articles that are on that website that, in my opinion, can be very helpful to all kinds of writers. And I think I've even written about film and, and how I can, I can be very helpful to filmmakers, too. And that's on the website. So, um, well, I can re- recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. I can recommend that because I have spent a lot of time looking at your website over, over these last eons. <laughs> oh, that gives me shivers. <laughs> there you are. What? I, I promise I'm not a stalker. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean it that way. <laughs> Just knowing You're my somebody. hero. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that gives me shivers too. Bless you, darling. (laughs) Donald, it's been so wonderful having you here today on Awaken Your Mind Magic and telling your wonderful story. And I know that it's going to uplift and inspire people listening all over the world. And a lot of the people that you've ghostwritten for and everything else, they'll be listening to this and thinking, yeah, he's my man. (laughs) (laughs) That's very nice. You are such an inspiring man. And you touch the hearts and minds of so many people, Don. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Susan. I appreciate it. Take care. Keep up your good work. Thank you, Don. You too. (laughs) And a big hug if I could give you one. Oh, it's a big virtual hug. You can't see this, everybody, but we virtual hugging. (laughs) Yeah, that's a first. (laughs) It's a first. Bye now. Okay, goodbye. I'll be speaking to you soon. That's Awaken Your Mind Magic for another week. If anything you've heard today has really impacted you and you want to know more or you would just like to connect with me, then visit my website, awakenyourmindmagic.com and reach out for a free one-on-one discovery session with me. where I'll be discussing more tools to unlock your dreams and live a limitless life that you would truly love to live. I'm Susan Kathleen, and this has been Awaken Your Mind Magic.